guys uh, for that. So, hey, we're really excited that you're here. Uh, we are going to be teaching and preaching through a passage today that says, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. So let's, let's make sure that we ask the Lord to come and, and be among us and, and do what only he can do, and then we'll, then we'll hop in. So Father, um, we just pray that your, your Holy Spirit would come and would fill us, and because your presence would hear, was here, um, you would build something something beautiful, something that goes beyond even our own imaginations. Build it in our lives, in our homes, and uh, in this church and in your church overall. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Well, we are finishing up a series called um, Current, and we're going to be kicking off a new series next week um, that we're, we're super excited about. It's, it's, um, it's called Connected, A New Way to Live, and it's going to be, we're actually for six weeks, beginning next week, we're going to be uh, doing the same study that our Avenue Kids is doing. It, we're really excited about that. So what they're studying over there, we're actually going to take the same passage and preach it over here, and so it's going to be a way for us to be thinking about how can we all live in a more connected way. You're going to hear some different voices during this series and see that we're all you know, uh, connected as, as one, as one family that's, that's pursuing Christ, and so we're really excited uh, to be able to do that and, and walk through that. And, and at the center of that is not only us being connected as a family, but us seeing how every passage is actually connected to Jesus. So we're, we're really excited because when you start connecting all of your life to Jesus, things, things start to change. And uh, so we're excited to explore that with you guys. That starts next week. Hey, so this week we're finishing our last message in this series called Current um, Godly Living in Today's World. And we're looking at children and, and parenting. And um, if you're thinking, hey, that doesn't apply to me, uh, if, you're, if you're a follower of Christ, and you have somebody who's pouring into you, or you're pouring into somebody else, then it applies to you, okay? Because what we're doing is we're going to take, take a look at what, what the scripture has to say about um, children and gospel parenting, and then, and then hopefully we're going to believe that God's spirit is going to make application to that wherever you might be, whether you're pouring into somebody who's your child, or you're pouring into somebody who's somebody else's child in our Avenue Kids program, or, or you're in a discipleship relationship, or a sponsorship relationship, and, and so I'm excited to see how God applies this um, to, to your heart, and so that's kind of where we're going to be going today, and we're looking at a different approach. We're going to be looking at a different approach. I don't know what your approach to sort of parenting and children is, but, but this might be a little bit different. So, uh, so hang with us and, and, and check it out. I wanted to bring, bring in a, a place where we normally start, which is the struggle is real. It's always good to um, define reality. And so, um, you know, when it comes to this idea of like uh, raising kids that love Jesus, godly children, however you might want to want to look at that. How can we be a church that does that? How can you be uh, parents or people who are involved in that? Um, defining reality is is good, right? And so, like, this is our reality. This is just kind of a snapshot of what uh, our day looked like. It was a couple weeks ago. Um, and just so you know, I'm I'm teaching and preaching this as though I need it, not as though I've accomplished it, and I, and I have a medal, and you should listen to me because I have a ton of experience. I'm just, like, learning it as I go as well. So I just want to, like, level with you that this is a living curriculum in our house. This is what our house looks like. So the other day, um, we're, we're getting to school, and anytime you make it to school on time, that's a huge victory in my house. I know, like, that might be just <clears throat> easy and, and, like, a normal thing for you, but getting kids on school uh, to, uh, to the right school on time without many people crying is an amazing morning. So this is how this morning was shaping up. I was uh, walking out to my minivan. Now, just to give you an even greater clarity of where we are in life, I drive, because I'm the man, I drive the like not so nice minivan. Okay? So you know that if you actually have two minivans, you are in it for, for real. If you just have one, I mean, you've entered into it a little bit, but I drive the one where the doors don't go zzzz. I got to like open them and shut them, which is awesome when you like drive up to pick up or, or like, you know, your kids and the safety patrol, they're like waiting to push the button. You're like, sorry, dude, this is not that decade. <laughs> you got to open this thing. Anyway, so that's mine. And it's awesome. I love it. But, you know, it actually, I feel like it gives me a little stripe on my man card because I'm driving the lesser minivan. If I was driving the, the nicer minivan, that would just be super weird. Okay. So anyways, I'm driving this one and well, I'm walking out to the car. And it's, I wouldn't say it's like a super hurry, 
but, but we're not, we don't have like the days that my children want to take to get into their car seats, you know? And so like we're, we're in that mode and my daughter, okay, so my 16 year old, she has, uh, I didn't know this, but, but she's kind of like followed me out, which is, that's abnormal because she has a car of her own and our 13 year old is sitting in that car waiting to be taken to his school and then she's going to then go to, to her school. Uh, I have a two year old in the house who is still with my wife because there's a doctor appointment. I don't know why. It's, you know, it's just like a, it's like a regular tithe or something. We just go to the doctor. <laughs> it was like, what, I, some, I don't know if somebody was sick or it was a well check or something's wrong. And we can't, I, somebody had to go seek medical assistance. That's all I know from my, from my two-year-old and my wife. And, and so my daughter's telling me, and, and then she, we begin this conversation. It seemed like it was a continuation of a conversation, but it had something to do with um, either homecoming or prom and like, and, and it led into like a promposal. Do you know what one of those are? You, that's a bad word for dads. That's a bad, bad promposal. So that's like a public, like when a guy publicly asks your daughter to either prom or, or homecoming and whatever. So we're kind of talking through this narrative in, in my daughter's life. And, you know, she's 16. This is happening in the morning. All the while, my three-year-old, because this is the best place to be at, like, I don't know, 7.45 in the morning, is on top, literally on top of my minivan. That's just a snapshot of our reality, okay? And so that's where we are. We've got a two-year-old and a 16-year-old, and we're still, like, figuring this stuff out. So this isn't coming to you from, oh, man, like, look at us. We've crushed it. You know, like, look at all our kids. Look at, this is like, man, I need this. So, so hear it from that, um, from that posture. So the struggle is real beyond just our kind of chaotic world, right? It's kind of a world, when it comes to our kids, of more now and better. They, they want more, and that's just kind of the culture that they're in. They, they might not even know they wanted more until they like watched TV or got on social media or whatever. Um, now, you know, you, because every, everyone should have Amazon Prime, <laughs> so like they want it now, and then better. It's better. So like what I have is, it's not bad, but we could probably get an upgrade around here, Dad. And so more, better, and now it's kind of the current culture that we live in. And, and, and so, again, just kind of setting, this is, this is what we operate in. We don't, we don't want to be um, blind to, to the reality of where we're living or where our kids are living. And, um, but we also want to be consistent. And so this is where what we're going to do is we're going to come back to the scripture and we're going to see what does God have to say about um, Godly living, godly parenting, godly pouring in to our children in today's culture. And so before we make like um, today's application, let's make sure that we're consistent with what the scripture has to say. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually do, do something that we don't normally do. Um, we're going to put the verse on the screen, but we're actually going to read this together. And um, we're, we're going to be reminded that Scripture is our highest authority, not my teaching, not sort of the way you're figuring this out in your head. Like, what the Word of God has already given us is our highest authority. And one of the ways that we're going to remind ourselves of that is we're going to all stand. So if you guys would stand right now, and we're going to read this together. If, if you're uncomfortable with that, that's super cool. You can just kind of look at the words. But I'm going to invite those of you who look at the scriptures as your highest authority um, to read this with me. It should be behind me. So we'll go ahead and start um, Psalm 127 there. And, and uh, let's, let's all read this together. One, two, three. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them, he shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Awesome. You may be seated. I don't know why the psalmist puts sleep right after kids. Like, that to me is, I'm not sure if that was just like the Lord being funny or what, but um, 
you can see that the, the two are there. So let, let's do this. Let's, um, let's just kind of break this psalm down for what it is, like biblically, before we, before we start making a ton of application here and what's, what's being said. Um, so, so this is a, a psalm of ascent. There's a few psalm of ascents that are gathered together. And, and this, um, this is a psalm that would be saying, potentially, uh, while somebody might be preparing, I, th- I, think the word, I think the idea is that as they're preparing to, to walk up into the temple or they're preparing for worship, these might be songs that were, were sung. And, um, and so what we see here is um, some truth about God and then, and then some application as to how this truth gets lived out in a particular area uh, of, of our life here. And, and if we're kind of going to work our way down um, the psalm. Could we go back to the, to the beginning of that psalm, sort of like verse 1, please, if you don't mind, sort of the unless. Awesome. So we have a couple of things here that are going to be what I would call critical reminders, critical reminders. And, and the first critical reminder is this word unless. I was like really captured by this word this morning. Basically, it's saying unless God shows up, all of your life is in vain. Unless it's built upon the person of God, and the person of God then empowers it, you labor in vain, you work in vain, you parent in vain. We, in our own power, cannot produce anything that would be beyond vanity unless the Lord shows up. And so it would be critical for us, right, if, if we're taking this, this seriously, it would be critical for us to ask ourselves, well, well how, how can we assure that God's presence will be in what we're doing? Two, two thoughts there kind of come out before we go any further. Number one, making sure that whatever it is that you're doing is according to the practice of Scripture, according to, the, to, to what the Word of God has to say. Because God is not going to show up and bless something that is not according to His Word. So knowing the word, studying the word, being able to apply the word to that particular area of your life is huge. So you need the, you need the precepts of God, but then you also need the power of God, which drives us to our knees and brings us to a place. Because we know that, that prayer activates God in a special and beautiful way. And so we, we, we align things according to what God's word says, and then, and then we pray into them, believing that if God doesn't show up, even if it's according to the practice of God, it could, it could fall vain if God, if God doesn't show up in his presence. And so, so it makes us a people of the word, and it makes us a people of, of prayer. So unless the Lord builds the house, um, it, it just it doesn't get built. Unless God protects whatever it is that you're trying to protect, well, that, that's also in vain. Um, next verse, please. We, play, we, we prayed um, last week, come Holy Spirit, come upon those marriages and people who just wanted a, a fresh filling of God's Holy Spirit. And, and that to me is the resounding prayer here of the beginning of this uh, psalm, is come Holy Spirit, come. Fill us, empower us, give us your presence in whatever it is that has been set before us. And that's kind of the, the theme of where this begins. So and then he, he goes on about how it's in vain that we, we get up early and, and we stay up late. And, and this, this idea of uh, that, that there's rest for his beloved. Now, this doesn't mean that, that you know, you should just call in tomorrow and be like, well, listen, I'm just following the Lord here. It's, I know it's 1030. I know I'm supposed to be there at 8, but like the Lord gives me rest, and I'm just believing that the Lord's going to teach my class. I know I missed two periods already, but you know, like, I'm believing that the Lord goes in front of me and fights my battles. That's a misuse. Okay? What we're saying here is that you can work hard. You can pour yourself out. You can give yourself to the task as long as it falls under the word of God, how God has told you to do it, and the power of God. If you try to act outside of those things, no matter how hard you work, it's just going to fall short. And as a matter of fact, when you know that you're, the way you're doing your job or the way you're parenting or the way your marriage looks is according to God's design and it's been prayed into, then you can rest. You don't have to overwork. You don't have to crush yourself in that. You can work hard, but, but you don't have to stay up late and get up early eating the bread of anxious toil because God gives sleep to his beloved. So that's kind of the first portion of this, of this psalm and of this teaching, is that unless God is in it, 
even the best practices fall empty. Now let's take a look at one of those practices. And so we start talking a little bit now about an application. This is another critical reminder, and it, and it, it leads us to kids. It leads us to parenting. It leads us to discipleship and all these um, sort of things. And so the author continues, behold. So like after you understand that God has to be the foundation of what we're doing, let me talk to you about something specific. Behold, like, like check this out. Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. So the first critical reminder that we see in this passage is that, um, that, that we, we, when it comes to children, they're, they're a blessing. They're, they're a reward. They're a gift from God. Now, some of us are going to be more highly acquainted with this than others. And it seems as though the less you have, the more this becomes a reality in your life. For instance, those who might be with us today who cannot have children, like understand this in a way that many of us maybe have forgotten. I just want to be sensitive to that. Pray God's comfort and favor and blessing over you if you're here and let you know that like God values you and we value, we value that pain. And we also value how you have a high perspective on what God does when he gives children. It's a critical reminder for all, for, for all of us that children are a gift, they're a heritage. It's like from God's heart to ours that he gives us um, our children. And then the psalm, can, and we'll just leave it right there on that, on that verse because this is where we're going to kind of camp out. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So let's just kind of be here for a second. Um, this idea, uh, that there's different metaphors for children and for parenting and all these sort of things in the scripture, but this is, this is one, of, it's one of my favorites. And, and I love this because it has maybe a different mentality than, than we're used to. It says something about you and it says something about your children that maybe you don't think a lot about as it pertains to you and your parenting. The first thing it says is about your children and it says that they are an arrow. An arrow. Now, I, I'm not like a, a, a huge um, warrior buff. I'm not a, a big hunter guy. I don't know a ton about weapons of like destruction. But I do know that when an arrow comes your way, it's not something that is to be like embraced as warm and cuddly, right? I mean, if somebody's shooting an arrow at you, you're probably getting out of the way because you know that when that arrow hits, it's going to actually destroy, the intent is that it would destroy its target. That it would actually go out there and it would bring destruction. But, but most of the time, especially in this culture, the destruction it would bring would be for the greater cause of the person who sent it. The destruction the arrow would bring would be for the greater cause of the person who sent it. So maybe that warrior was hungry, and it was to feed the camp. Or maybe that warrior was in battle, thus warrior, and it was to fight against an enemy. It was to pierce a darkness that was coming against the warrior who shot it. But if we're going to stick here with the metaphor, we have to, we have to be reminded that an arrow is meant to do two things. For, whoa, sorry. First of all, I get excited about this stuff. First of all, an arrow is meant to be sent. An arrow is not meant to be kept. Nobody applauds the warrior who dies with a ton of arrows in his or her quiver. It's like, wow, you had a full quiver of arrows and you didn't shoot any of them. Way to take it for the team. No, you're like, you missed the point of why you got an arrow. It was to send it. And the second thing an arrow is supposed to do is it's, it's supposed to, as I said, it's supposed to do damage. It's supposed to bring destruction to an enemy, to a force that is against what the warrior has said we are for. The second thing is warrior. So, so I, you know, I don't know if you think about your kids as, I mean, depending on your age of your kids, you might think of them as like a little weapon of destruction. <laughs> Mine has an amazing arm, and if he winds up, and before you can say, don't do that, if he lets it go, you better get out of the way. You better be dodging and dodging. So I understand destruction. That's not the kind of destruction we're talking about. 
Or maybe, maybe it's a little bit new for you to think about your child as somebody who's supposed to be sent rather than kept. I don't know. I don't know, but those are, those are, we're going to talk about some critical shifts that have to happen here according to this verse, uh, but not yet. Let me talk just one second here about, if you could go one back, please, about the parent, because it calls um, parents warriors. Warriors. So I don't know what you think about your parenting. There's other places in the scripture where it talks about nurturing, it talks about exhortation and encouragement. And so it's not the only picture that's given for parents, but it's, it's a pretty strong visual for us to start to get our minds around uh, as one who suits up and goes to battle with a mission greater than just staying in the camp where we are. Like warriors take territory. Warriors defend things. Warriors are known for how they battle. Understanding that this is not just, oh, well, let's get a few parenting principles that'll maybe help us and we'll have a happier home. No, this is war. There is a spiritual war going on that, that we are oftentimes um, uh, neglecting to the detriment of both ourselves and our children. Because if I am called to be a warrior and I go out as though there's no war going on, both myself and my children will get hurt. So there might be some shifts that we want to take a look at. So let's go ahead and go to that slide here. And if you've got an outline, I think it's like there somewhere towards the middle of your outline. We're going to talk about some critical shifts that are going on from and to, uh, according to this passage. And so. One of the questions that, that I think should be surfacing at this point is, um, you know, as a parent, you probably ask yourself this question of, like, um, am I doing this right? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I mean, if your kids are, like, if you just have teenage kids, maybe you just quit asking. You're like, whatever. <laughs> They're teenagers. It's going to work out. But at some point along the line, I, I, my, life, my wife and I find us asking this question pretty frequently, like, am, are we doing this right? Are we like ruining this kid here, basically? Is, it, is this supposed to be like this? And, um, and, and I don't think that's a bad question. Um, but I think one of the questions that we need to, to think, start thinking through from this particular passage is, um, like, am I training for the kind of warfare that I've been called to enter into for both myself and my child? How well do I handle the weapon that's been given to me? What kind, of, like, what kind of shot am I with this, with this bow and arrow that God has given to me? Am I practicing? I mean, these are questions that a warrior might ask. It's like, am I ready for this battle? Do I know how to use what has been given to me? Not just, am I doing uh, this right? And so, you know, as we start to think about answering those questions, we have to have probably a critical shift that happens in a few areas. I've noted a few there, I think, for you on your outline, and it's from and to. So one of the first areas that we would have to have a critical shift in, if we're going to start thinking about arrows and warrior and, and how well do we send our kids, is a shift from earning to expectancy. From earning to expectancy. And, and this, well, this would really be um, reflected in your prayer life. So you know that you're probably a parent, and remember, I'm going to talk to you from one who's, who's like struggling through this, okay? This isn't like uh, I, we have this on lockdown. But you probably are more on the earning side as though like you're earning a good kid if your prayer life is, is like, um, if you kind of like are always needing to be reminded to pray for your kids and to pray for your marriage and to pray for other people's kids and things like that, like, or if you're single, to, to pray for your singleness in the midst of your parenting, whatever that case may be. If your prayer life is in constant need of, oh, you know, are you praying for your kid? Are you pray, are you, and what are you praying for your kid? If, it's, if you're always needing to be encouraged to pray for your child, you're probably a little bit more on the earning spectrum, where you think that you're earning a good kid by all of your effort as a parent. Now, so this is me. This, this, so I just like, this is, I, I need to make more of a shift from earning to expectancy. So earning, and it's not bad that like I'm, there's effort being put in, like I might take a class, we've got a parenting on purpose workshop that I highly recommend that was very influential to my wife and I this October. It's going to be from, from nine to eight over at Trinity, or nine to eight, from nine to noon at, over at Trinity and um, Dr. Bob Barnes, highly, highly influential. Those are all good things, but 
But there's got to be a shift in my heart where I move from thinking, if I just do enough of the right things, I'm going to earn a kid who loves Jesus and is like a, knows how to be uh, married healthy, knows how to parent healthy, knows how to contribute to society healthy. I need to shift from like me earning that to me expecting that to be something that God builds into my child. And the way that I would know where I am on that, again, is, is, is my prayer life. It's like how fervently, how often... How much am I expecting God to parent my child, and, and, and what am I doing there? And so, um, you know, I, I think this is, this is a big move for us to be praying more and more over our children. Come, Holy Spirit, come, and help Cole to walk in love today, and help John, and help Maria, whoever the case may be, and, and like a constant laying on of hands of your children where you're, where you're actually physically touching them, as we talked about last week, and just praying God's blessing into and over them. There's something about when a parent, a parental authority places his or her hand on the, the, the children they've been given spiritual supervision of and prays God's spirit and blessing and favor into them. Listen, that's powerful. The enemy would hate it if you lived like that Monday through Friday. And your kids would probably be changed. They might not understand it. It doesn't matter how old. It doesn't matter when you start. They might not understand that at the beginning, but they would begin to probably experience things they've yet to experience if you, as their parental authority, stood and, and waged war simply by expecting God to do far more than sort of your, your awesome routine. The second shift uh, would be from burden to, burden to blessing. From burden to blessing. And so um, yeah, kind of depending on on where you are in your children and their ages and things like that. Um, this is a, a battle that my wife and I uh, work through very frequently uh, because it's hard for us to consistently see uh, uh, our children as blessings all the time. They're just super demanding. And you, you can almost see, like in, the, in, in our, some of our older children that can care for themselves, we can dialogue. Th that, that's kind of like, oh, okay, well, I can see, I can see sort of some of that, and, and there's a great, beautiful blessing in that relationship, but, but the hard work that it took to get there kind of sometimes seems like a burden, and so now that we're back walking through that, when we're not in a healthy place, we can, we can really feel burdened by what God has said is a blessing, and um, I think there's a critical shift that needs to happen for both us and our children, for, for that to be moments even when things go wrong, of blessing and not burden. Because, uh, for instance, like Dr. Paul Tripp says, when my, when my children fail, it's never an inconvenience for me. It's never like, oh, man, like I was going to do this today, and now you screwed it up. I don't know if everyone's ever been there. Okay? But, but sometimes we live like, man, I'm just trying to do this. I'm just trying to accomplish this. And really what we're saying is, is when you come in and you disobey and, and you disobey again, you're disrespectful or whatever the case may be, you've interrupted my quest for comfort. I know what my heart wants. And you've broken into it. And you have gone from blessing to burden when we're not in a good place. And so for the Lord to breathe life into where we are in our parenting and for us to begin to see ourselves more as a warrior who's ready with his or her uh, weapon of choice, there's going to need to be a shift from, from burden to blessing. Like, this is an awesome opportunity for you to experience the gospel, but I'm going to need the gospel first or I'm going to crush you. That's kind of how it works. Like, you can't enter in and give somebody something you don't have. So what's awesome is for us to begin to see those moments, especially those moments of failure, as blessings rather than burdens, we're going to have to say, Jeez, even in that moment, Jesus, I need you right now because what I have in the flesh is not going to be good for them or me. And then I get to come into their world and say, just as I need Jesus, you too are going to need Jesus to be able to make some changes in your life, whether they're 2, 3, or 16. From blessing to burden is a critical shift, or, or if we're always in kind of the burden mindset, we're never going to be outward focused and thinking about the fact that we may need to send our children into a world to do damage, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Another shift here would be from artwork to arrows. From artwork to arrows, 
I think sometimes I feel like my children are a canvas that I'm painting on, and what I really want you to do is applaud me along the way, and especially when I do a good piece that looks really good. I just want to be like, you see my kid, he's got nice manners, or she's got nice manners, and she's making some good decisions, she's kind of like flourishing in an area of life. There's something in my heart that just kind of, like, it rejoices because I love them and that's healthy, but there's also something in my life that kind of wants you to know that I'm the artist that created that, and when you see her or him doing well, you can go ahead and applaud me too. So like that's just a reality, right? Like like that's that's again, this is our reality. This is our so this is some of the things that we're working through. And if we're if we're seeing our children as artwork rather than arrows, then what we're gonna do is we're going to um, create an environment where they're always safe, where they're always protected, and where we're gonna put some pressure on them to look good because we know that that reflects us. Yo, know, like that's no way to grow up. You, you, you don't want to grow up like that in an environment where, where it's all about really the person that's behind the scenes. And there's always like this protected sort of thing where, um, you know, like you're, you, their identity is so connected to how you're doing. I mean, that's pretty much raising your child to the level of an idol. And your children make horrible gods. They just never come through. And they always leave everyone around them, including themselves, wanting and frustrated and, and hurt. But the shift that we see here in the scripture is from artwork to arrow. So as I need Jesus as a parent and as Jesus continues to transform my heart, and this is true of people we disciple as well, right? Like, I discipled this guy, but then he started not doing well, so, you know, like, we, we ended. No, no, that's still your guy. Like, you're still walking that course with your guy, saying, this is my guy, even in this season. Because what we know is that it's not about artwork, it's not about me, it's about being an arrow, it's about being sent. Artwork stays placid in one place, protected, and people come and admire it. Arrows actually get sent further than the warrior and into a world that's living one way and it upends that world. Arrows go out and they pierce dark areas of the world, bringing the light of the gospel in a way that the warrior couldn't. They go further than the warrior, and they do greater damage for the sake of the warrior's gospel, which hopefully is Jesus Christ, than the warrior could do without it. And so when you start to shift and think of your son or your daughter or your children as, as ones who are going to be sent out to do damage, they're ones that are going to be sent out to bring the gospel into dark areas and to destroy things like racism bigotry, hatred, chauvinism. They're going to destroy poverty. They're going to destroy children across the world who are dying from diseases that don't need to be, that don't need to be dying from those diseases. They're going to destroy sex trafficking. They're going to destroy certain evils in this world that are absolutely against the gospel. When you start to see your children as agents of destruction that are going to bring the light of the gospel to the world in a way that you never could, I mean, it changes how you respond to them at times in Target when they're on the floor. <laughs> and you start sweating because you're thinking, what is everyone thinking of me right now? Why did I wear my Avenue Church shirt today? I don't know that, don't go to that, I, I don't know anything about that. It changes, changes. Hey, another critical shift would be from, from warrior to warrior. From warrior to warrior. So, um, in this particular shift, some of us think that our greatest job is to be the chief warrior for our children. And, and we, kind of, we, will, we might not say that. But, you know, we kind of live like this, and um, we uh, are, are always there, and we're always making sure th it's kind of like we, uh, we, we're so exhausted because all we've done is kind of like worry here and worry there and worry there. And we think like there's some supernatural power in our worry, as though that's going to be the control that protects our children and raises them up into these. And, and you might even do it in a way that's, that's godly. Like you have a desire for your kids to love God and serve God, and, and so you think that you're worrying is going to do that. 
Now, I'm not saying that we don't protect our children. I'm not saying that we don't make sure that our children are in healthy environments that are appropriate to where they are developmentally and all those sort of things. But the fundamental identity of you as a parent is not chief warrior. It's warrior. Warrior. Understanding that both you and your child have been called to something greater than simply a, a good education and a, and a high athletic career. Like, there's way more to what's at stake besides producing an 18-year-old who might be hireable or eligible for college. There's, there's way more at stake. We've been called to join God in the renewal of all things. And the only way we do that is when we start to understand that we're at war to do that, that there's a world and an enemy that hates that and would love for us to simply raise polite, good children. God has not called you to give your life to raise simply polite and good children. There's nothing wrong with that. Please, thank you, yes, ma'am, yes. There's nothing wrong with polite, kind children. What's wrong is when they begin to think and you begin to think you've hit the pinnacle of what God has called you to do simply because your kid knows how to sit in his seat throughout the school day. Arrows, warrior, something greater out there specifically for your child because you know an arrow doesn't just go in a general direction. An arrow has a specific target. So that means in prayer, you should be asking the Father to say, what specifically do you want this one child of mine to go out and penetrate and destroy? Where do you want to send coal? What do you have for Cade? What, Lord, are you speaking to me over Cora so that I can begin to pray over? What about Caroline? Where can I begin to target her now as a 16-year-old believing that you want to send her right there? These are the things of a warrior. The things of a warrior more like this. Warriors understand that there are, there's damage that happens along the way. That people bleed. That there are scars. That you get it wrong along the way. That you actually lose battles so that you can win the war. Warriors aren't concerned about minor losses. They're not concerned about blood loss. They're not concerned about... They, they have a strong enough stomach to say... Son, I know that this is crippling you right now. I know that this is breaking your heart down right now. But listen, God is going to use this to sharpen you so that you might be sent in a humble and beautiful way to bring the gospel to those who are vulnerable that could never see Jesus without you. It's a shift in our mindset. And so this is kind of what it might look like if we were to change our ways. I mean, that's the question I want to ask. What would it look like if we were to, to maybe change some of our ways as it, as it pertains to this? There's a list here, and I won't have time, if we could get that list, I won't have time to kind of go over every one of these in this list. But I went to this website that um, had all, everything about like bow and arrows, because I don't know a ton about bow and arrows. But I'm like, I bet there's some gospel implications if this is the metaphor that we could learn from how to shoot. Does anybody, does anybody know how to shoot a bow and arrow? Great. So have grace on me right now, because I'm going to enter into your world, and I'm going to try to talk about a few things that are like bow and arrow people specific. So, so have a little grace, grace for me. But here, here we go. These are the, I think, the seven things that are most important to shooting an arrow correctly. We've got a stance, a bow grip, a draw, an anchor, an aim, a release, and a follow-through. All right, so first of all, the, the, the stance is huge, right? So I'm not going to go into all of these. But, like, you know, um, what they were saying is how you position your body is really important to, to your um, aim in the target. And I was thinking about our stance as um, people who disciple people, who, who pour into people, who parent. Our stance is hugely important. And this is, man, this is, this is what it's got to look like. Here's our stance. Ready? It's right here. First of all, not, listen, not petitioning for our kid, like, God, please bless my kid. God, please keep, no, th look, this is our stance right here. God, I just worship you for who you are. Lord Jesus, your name is beautiful, and you are our greatest treasure. We bow to you first and foremost. That we would come from a place of worship first. That, that our stance would be that we worship King Jesus before we worship our children, because the, the draw to that is going to be really difficult. 
And then we can enter into prayer. And then we can enter into God, ex- expecting God to do things that we never could. And then, and then we, we've got this bow grip. And they were talking about um, where, where this is one where you have to have a firm handle on it, but you can't squeeze too hard. Or, or the whole thing will be like um, off, off kilter. And I was thinking about like, as, as we parent, understanding we have a hand on it. This isn't just like, God, do your thing. You know, like, I'm just going to wait until they're 18 and see how you did, Lord. Good luck with this one. You know, this is no, my hands are on it, but they're not choking it out or else I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the target. But they're also not loose enough to, to be like, you know, well, this is just, I don't really have a role in this. No, this is you and God working in cooperation. It's you being filled with the Spirit and knowing where to look and how to pull and all these sort of things. And then we've got to, we've got to draw in, in an anchor. And so the draw is obviously the, kind of the way you take it back. And there's like a stretching, needing to know how far to stretch both the bow and, and the arrow within the bow. And, and so you might think of this as, man, how far do I stretch my child? What kind of situations am I willing to put them in? If I leave them right there, then when I send them, they're going to be like, boop. And the enemy's going to be like, hell. Yeah. The enemy's going to be applauding you if you've got your jaw like this, by the way. Keep it up. Keep them in that environment. Don't let them get hurt. Don't let them see temptation. Don't let them do this. Don't let them do that. Listen, again, I'm not against protecting kids at appropriate things. I'm just saying let's engage and equip rather than just like always, no, 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 my, I, my kid can't. Let's think through and pray through and get in communities and say, hey, what do you think about this? Oh, you, th- you, th- you're gonna, you think I should be, but okay, I can, oh, all right. The anchor is, they said, it's important for the anchor to be um, like put on your face. And, and there's like this thing where it's like you, you anchor it and you put it right up here. And, and I was just thinking, man, if your kids are not in close proximity to you, you have zero chance of this. And what I mean by that is, listen, your kids might be in, in, in D- South Dakota. They might be in California. You might not have custody of your kids right now. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you are not pouring yourself in to placing your kids right here, whether it's through the phone or social media, however you contact your kids, if you're not putting in energy to bring your kids to this anchor, whether they're right here in South Florida or somewhere else, then you, it's like you're shooting your bone air like this. There needs to be a proximity here, which means there needs to be a proximity to your heart, and they need to know that you need the same Jesus they do. That's how you anchor them in Christ. The aim is obviously what we talked about a little bit before. It's like, man, I, I need, maybe I need in my parenting, maybe I need to be a little bit more outward focused. Maybe I need to be a little bit more out. Just a practical thing. So, so with Cade, some of you know Cade. I don't know if this is true or not. I've been praying. The Lord seems to put this on my heart. I feel like Cade is going to be an arrow that is sent into the racial reconcili- re- reconciliation world, um, w- even within, like, outside of the church, but even specifically in the church. And I feel like he's going to break down walls that, that haven't been broken down before. So I've, I, I, I could be wrong. That could shift in the midst of battle. But I've just been praying over that. That's been something I feel like I've been hearing. And so I have an aim for Cade. I have an aim for all my kids, every single one of them. Again, I'm a warrior, so I, it might shift in the midst of battle, but I, I, I have a sense of where I believe God wants to send them, shoot them. And so because of that, now we can talk about those things. We, I can maybe equip more in that area. We can, we can get ready. We can aim. We can aim. Our aim is not just here and this. Our aim is a little bit more out there. And then there's a release. And man, this is, this is like really difficult. This isn't just something you do when they're 18. This to me is something you do on a continual basis. It's like really, all right, can they go to the mall or not? I don't know. I don't know. Well, how old was I? How old was, I don't know. Listen, I, I'm releasing and I don't know. Maybe that was good. Maybe that was bad. Anyways, it's a constant thing where I'm thinking about how am I releasing them into the world because there's going to come a day when really, I mean, you know a warrior with, with his or her arrow, with that particular arrow, they get one shot. It's cool to practice in these moments, and I think that you should release, 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 but, but you get one shot with your one arrow, and we want to make the best use of it. And, and so then there's a follow-through, and that's basically where it's like, man, um, I, I don't just shoot an arrow. Like, check this out. I still really need a mom and dad. Right there. I still really need my mom and dad to be my mom and dad. 
and to follow through on the things that they ingrained on me growing up. They don't just shoot it and then stand back and watch. No, they shot it and then they follow through. It might not be as close a distance as it once was, but I still need them to follow through and be the warriors they were for 18 years. And your children, as you release them over time to this and to that, man, follow through, follow them through, follow it up with gospel conversations, and this is where we got to end. So we're getting current, right, and we're thinking about this, this idea of um, warrior. One of the questions that you should be asking is, am I training? Am I training like this? So getting, am, I, am I okay with this shift from saving my children to sending my children? Now listen, I understand you have to, prote again, protect and appropriate and protect and appropriate, but, but if I'm going to get current, if we're going to get current together, are we more in the mindset of how am I going to save my children from this current world? Or how am I going to send them into this current world for the sake of Jesus? And we couldn't do that unless we made it about Jesus. And so I want my kids to grow up knowing that there is a God who loves them in the midst of their most horrific, repeated failures, pursues them, and has proven that through the death and resurrection of Christ. I want my kids to know about a God who, when they repeatedly fail because they choose to and want to, know that there is a God who sent his son and was, was, was crushed for that. I want my kids to know of a God who loves them in the midst of all their good and all their bad and put their sin upon Christ and Christ died in their place and rose from the dead and, and they through faith and repentance, through, through giving up on their own effort and their, their best moral behavior, when they, when they give up on themselves and they come to the person of Jesus and say, Jesus, man, it's you. It's just you. I know I'm here again, but Jesus, you still want me. You still died for me, and you're still living within me. I want my kids to know that gospel of a God of grace that pursues them at all times and not only forgives them because he's punished Christ in their place, but also frees them to be the arrows that they were called to be. Check it out. If you talk about your kids about being the most amazing seventh grader, that might be kind of inspiring. But if you talk to them about how God wants to change the world through them, about how God wants to bring gospel renewal, how God wants to bring dead people to life through their life, things start to shift, and only the gospel can free them beyond the more and the now and the better. I want my kids to know that kind of God who radically is affectionate for them in all times. It's for them and with them and wants to do something through them. And so as we kind of spend our last few minutes here together, I wanted to address something that is very um, specific to us and our current needs here. And uh, it actually pertains to our Avenue kids specifically. Again, leadership, we always want to um, define reality. And, and here's the reality. Michael James defined this for me really well. He said... You know how in scripture, like, um, if you can't get your family right, you kind of lose the authority to lead others? It says that about, like, pastors and people who, in leadership in the church. It's like, if your family isn't in a good place, you need to leave the preaching and the teaching and the leading ministry, and you need to go pay attention to your family. So you need to forfeit your authority over here to make sure home's right. Because nothing would be more important than home being right. He said, you know, as a church, that's true for us as well. I mean, we want to affect Delray. We want to plant churches. We want to go beyond just this auditorium with the gospel of Jesus. We believe these same things are true for us. But if we can't care properly and well for our own children, we actually lose the authority in the city of Delray Beach and beyond to, like, stand for anything beyond ourselves. And that was really eye-opening to me because our reality is we don't have enough people to care for our kids like we need to. Like literally, our Avenue Kids ministry is making it barely every week with the amount of volunteers that we have. The reality of it is there may come a day where we just have to close it once a month 
because it's just too short of volunteers. The reality of it is, I, I talked to a, a friend of mine, and, and he shared, man, this is, it's my fifth week in a row in Avenue Kids. He doesn't even have a child in Avenue Kids. He's just kind of been serving because he's been called upon for this or for that. And, um, you know, so the reality of it is, we have this beautiful opportunity to put into play because it's, you know, the whole arrow thing? That's not just true of your own personal kids. That's true of you to my children and me to your children because we're a covenant family. And so, and so here we are in this sort of reality check moment. If you believed any of what we just taught on, we have an opportunity and a necessity to respond. And I think that we can do better than some of our sports city leagues. You know, our sports city leagues, they're all parent run. They're all like, man, like there, there's like hardly any staff out there. It's everybody, it's got parents that, that make it flourish and do it like really, really well. I just feel like what we're doing here is more important than teaching my kid to hit a curveball. I love that. But I, I feel like there's something going on here that we need to pay attention to that even the city around us pays attention to in their own respectives. And so, you know, if you're new here and you're just kind of like checking it out and you're like, man, I, I really like what's going on over there, it's, it's, it's started to flourish in a really sweet and beautiful way. Um, hear what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. If, if you just had like birthed a child, hear what I'm saying. But if you're beyond sort of like the birthing and you're beyond like this is my second week here, I just want to be really direct with you. It's no longer an opportunity not to serve. Like you have a few opportunities I want to make clear to you. I'm talking to the parents now of, of children who, who benefit from Avenue Kids. And I want to, you have a few opportunities that we want to put in front of you. One of the opportunities is to not serve any longer. That we're going to take that one off the table and I'm going to let you know what is on the table. We need you. If you have a child in our Avenue Kids ministry and you're benefiting from it, we need you. It's, it's, it's no longer a thing where somebody else is going to pick that up. We need you to come and bring the things that we just taught about to them. So here, here's your opportunity. Here's your opportunity to engage. Here's your opportunity to take a step. Even if you're in a space where life is really demanding, your family needs you. And, and so I talked to Jerry, who's our, who's our, our family life pastor, who's, who's supervises this. He's like, get, we talked about options. You could serve once every two months. Once every two months. Somebody from your family over there saying, yeah, I, I, I put my name down once every two months. I can help you with that. You could serve once a month. Or you could serve once every other week, which we have... You know, we, we kind of came out of a season where most of our volunteers were doing that. We've got even a couple doing more than that. Once every two weeks, once a month, or once every two months. I'd like for you to, like, um, we're not, this isn't just like a cool way to end the service. Like, we actually need you to do this. So could you take out your phone, please, if you're a parent that is participating in the Avenue Kids? If you're not a parent, that's cool, man. Like, the boat's open. <laughs> you can tell we need help here. And we just want you to email, like, right now, info at the Avenue Church, info at theavchurch.com, what you're going to do. Once every two months, once a month, every other week. Just let us know. And it, it, could, it could be one from your family, but we, we understand you might have to do split squad on certain things. We just need to do this better. We believe we're called to it. We believe you want to do it. And sometimes you just don't know that that's our need because we haven't made it clear to you. So we love you. We believe in God's spirit in you. And we also want to thank all the volunteers who have been just giving themselves selflessly to make this thing a beautiful reality. Can we give them a hand right now? Those guys who are right there. Right now. The army... It needs you. We need some fellow warriors. So let this be an opportunity for you to engage and, and see God meet you in a really special and beautiful way. Let's stand for prayer. And um, I'm going to have our prayer partners come down. So if you're one of our prayer partners, would you start making your way down here? Because we may have people who, who want to be prayed over. They, they need to maybe make one of those shifts that we talked about. 
and they may want to meet the Lord. They may want to meet that type of God that I was explaining I want my kids to grow up with. Uh, we want to give you the opportunity to come down and be prayed for and, and uh, somebody put a hand on you and just ask God's blessing and favor and spirit to, to be yours today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you and we thank you for how you've called us to things that are not easy, that are not convenient, they're, they're not things that we might think are, are where we are right now, Father, but it's, it's where you have us as a church family. And so God, I pray that your Holy Spirit, beyond any kind of, hey, this is where we're going, this is what we need, I pray that your Holy Spirit would compel hearts to, to say yes to what you're doing with our youth to what you're doing with the future of this church. Holy Spirit, please come and fill us and, and give us an encouragement to say yes to where our family needs us. And, and I just pray that you would meet us in a really special way for stepping out in faith and walking in obedience to what, to what the Father's doing. So Father, thank you for your, for, for your presence among us. Thank you for your spirit. God, would you make us warriors in all that we do who understand that it is our great gift to experience you as we send those around us to make a difference for the name of Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Love you guys. See you.